Uh, welcome to another episode of QP Personalities. We're here today hanging out with Barbara Workus. She's uh, 87 years young, and she's, uh, you describe yourself as, uh, what did you tell me, that you're a, uh, a Jill of all traits, but mistress of none. That- Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So why, why do you go by that? Well, I've gone through life like a kid in a candy shop. I've tested a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I've done many things. I never did any of them particularly well, but I did a a lot of them. And one of the first things I did was become a medical technologist. And the backstory on that is when I was in high school, I did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, but I was keeping company with a young man, as we called it back in the day, keeping company, it wasn't going steady, we're going back. Um, <laughs> and he was a year ahead of me in school. Now he knew what he wanted to do when he was going to college when he graduated, which meant I would still be a year behind him if I went to college. Now I wanted to get married and live happily ever after. So I went to a career day at a local hospital And they had the laboratory open. And when I went in there, I was fascinated. Uh, There was Bunsen burners and and machines and the lab techs had white coats on and they were running where they looked so important. And when I found out that I only needed two years of college and then a 12 month program to train me to be a medical technologist. After that, I would have to sit for a national exam. If I passed that, I could work anywhere and I would be finished just as he was graduating from college. So I thought that was a good deal. So that's what I did. I did the uh, two years of college with a, a heavy concentration of science courses, of course. And I took the 12 month course, I passed the exam Uh, We got married. We moved down to Houston, Texas, because that's where he got his first job. And um, I got a job right away in a a hospital down there. I also got pregnant right away. So we got married in February. By December, I had the first of my four sons. And of course, I stopped working. Now, fast forward, going through the years, And I'm going to have to go back and forth. My life wasn't a straight line. It kind of intersected at different points. But staying on the medical technology thing, I stopped working, did not work uh, during the time my boys were growing up. However, about 20 years down the line, the marriage was falling apart. I knew I was going to have to get back into the workforce. And I saw a program for women like myself who wanted to get back in. And I signed up for it. It was a bit of a shock because when I got to the uh, laboratory, it was like being dropped in the bar at Star Wars. I, in the tw- I recognized nothing, <laughs> nothing. It was all automated. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? But I said, no, I have to do this. So I did. I started the program. And then I saw an ad in the paper for a, a tech. And just on a whim, I uh, called and applied for it. And when I went into the for the interview, I was met by a formidable older woman who was the director of the lab. And she hired me on the spot. And I go, well, wait, I haven't finished my training program. She said, don't worry about that. She said, you're going to work for me. I'm going to train you. And it turned out that my age actually was a plus because I had had my family. I wasn't going to be getting pregnant. I wasn't going to be running home for a sick kid. So I ditched the training program and I went to work for her. I worked with her for about five years, and then I transferred to um, a closer hospital and worked there for about 16 years. And in the meantime, automation kept encroaching, 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 and I find myself in my 60s without a med tech job. Um, Now, I have to backtrack. We'll come back to that. But I have to backtrack because the second thing I did was as my boys were growing up, one of them was having trouble in school. And I was getting, he's not working up to his potential. Uh, He did not focus, uh, all the buzzwords. And I'm going, what am I going to do with this kid? All my other kids are fine. What's what's up with this one? So 
a substitute teacher came in one day and she contacted me. She said, Mrs. Workus, she said, your son is very bright. She said, but he's got a learning problem. Now we're going back 50 years. You know, we're learning disabilities were not the thing that they are today. There were no child study teams and all that. So she said, I would have him tested if I were you. I said, well, that's my kid. I got to do what I got to do. So I did. I took him to a, uh, I guess it was a psychologist. And he ran a battery of tests and discovered that he was dyslexic, okay? Could not interpret the printed word the way we can. Auditorily, he was much better. If you read stuff to him, not only could he comprehend it, but he could also retain it. So I'm like, now how do I help this kid? What do I do? I went back to school. I went back to Kane, well, to Kane University now, it was Kane College then. And it was funny because we lived very close by and you can, you can never find a parking lot, a, a parking space. <laughs> That's every so, school. <laughs> I know, it's horrible. So luckily, I would throw a load of wash in the laundry. I'd get on my bike and I'd pedal over to Kane. I'd go to my class and come back. I did complete it. I graduated. They took all of my credits from the uh, medical, th which was a real help because I managed to finish it in two years. I graduated uh, magna cum laude with a major in special ed and a minor in um, early childhood. Never actually worked in a classroom, okay? Did some substitute work, but it was mainly to help my son, okay? And uh, then I kind of uh, put that on the back burner. And as I said, I went back into the medical technology. Now, 62, 63, uh, yes, I had my social. I had a small pension from the hospital but I still wanted to work. I was too young. So I dusted off my teaching certifications and I got a part-time job at a learning center to tutoring. I did that for a couple of years, did not like that place, and I transferred to Sylvan. And I've been there for 20 years tutoring, okay? And that was a bit of a ride because um, at one point, the director at that time uh, came in one day and she said, we're switching over to iPads. Automation strikes again. <laughs> so I'm like, oh dear God. And she looked directly at me because she knew I was much older than the rest of the teachers. And she said, Barbara, are you okay with that? Oh yeah, I'm fine. No worries. I run home. I call my grandson. You got to teach grandma how to use the iPad. So he did. I learned it. I have my own now. And I, yeah, and I, it's, it's, it's all cool. So I'm still there. I'm still uh, going in a couple of hours a week. Um, I love it. I love being with the kids. It is a challenge, but it's close by. And uh, uh, that's been very helpful. Now, medical technology, um, teacher, the handicapped, or spe well, that's like was special ed. There was another thing I did that I could have gotten paid for, but I, I it was way too much and I volunteered instead. One of my sons came home and told me that he had joined a first aid squad, a rescue squad. Well, didn't actually join it. Uh, they, him and some of his friends founded this uh, organization. And of course, they need volunteers. So, you know, I've always been a, a, a mom. I always do what I needed to do. And I will tell you how it came about. They were clever, these young people. My son and his friends would arrive at my door on my precious day off from work with the rig. The rig, with its flashing lights and shiny chrome, its aura of importance and excitement. Come ride with us, they tempted. Take a course, it's easy. It wasn't easy. But I did take an American Red Cross Advanced First Aid course, and a year later, found me enrolled in an emergency medical technician course, earning state certification and a coveted EMT patch for my uniform. I did that, I volunteered with them for eight years. I was two takeaways from this. Um, it was amazing. Uh, it's arguably the most exciting eight years of my life. And one New Year's Eve, uh, my son said, Ma, we got to keep the rig in service. Everybody wants to party tonight. We got to keep the rig. I, okay, fine. I'm not going anywhere. So we were down in the squad room, and uh, all of a sudden, a call comes in woman in labor, 10 minutes to midnight. Oh my God. 
So we jump in the rig, we fly over there, and here's this lovely woman, second pregnancy, contractions are very close together, and she tells us she wants to go to a hospital a few towns over. And my son said, ma'am, you need to go to the closest hospital. You're not gonna make it. Well, she got upset. She said, I wanna be with my doctor. And I looked at my son, I said, I had four kids. I know the bond a woman establishes with her OBGYN guy. I said, let's take her. So he looked at me, he said, all right, we package her up. We get her in the rig. Her husband came with us and it was so sweet. He, they, she had an older child. He took an eight by 10 picture of the boy who was parceled off to a neighbor at that point and brought it with us in the rig so that he could be part of the whole thing. We get on the Garden State Parkway. My son's driving. I'm in the back. Now I'm an EMT. I've been trained. Uh, when we went through childbirth at EMT, they have a big mannequin. They put it on a table and the direct, the uh, instructor gets on the other side and he has a baby plastic doll that he pushes through when you catch it and you know, you go through the whole routine. So I'm sitting back there monitoring this woman and all of a sudden I see the head and I call out to my son, we've got crowning, <laughs> like we've got lift off and I'm going, oh my God. So I, I didn't panic, I did not panic and bless this child, it was a little girl, textbook, textbook, did exactly what I expected her to do, got her, caught her, held her up. My son had by that time pulled over and parked safely. He came back, he cut the cord, as I wasn't doing it, I was all teary up. <laughs> and we wrapped her up, put her next to the mom, and then continued on to the hospital. The, uh, the obstetrician was in the parking lot waiting for us, so we opened the rig and we said, she's here. And he's like, oh God, you don't need me. And when we had called in, we called in and said, mother and daughter doing fine. We got a round of applause from the people in dispatch. So he took over from there. Now, going on from there, every year after that, the mom has sent us, my son and I, a picture of our New Year's Eve baby <laughs> with a little letter telling us about her uh, update for the for the year. So when she turned 25, because this is a, going back again, when she turned 25, I had saved all the pictures. I made a DVD with her pictures, and I found an instrumental of uh, As Time Goes By, and I put that as the background music and sent it to her for her birthday. So they were very happy about that. The other takeaway um, from uh, this uh, eight years is I wrote a book. I wrote a book about my squat experiences. I called it Received and Responding, which is what you say if you're out on the road and they call you on the, uh, my, the radio and give you a location and a, a, you know what's going on and you pick up the mic and you say Received and Responding. You receive the message, you're gonna respond. I took 25 of my most interesting courses and they run the gamut from sad to silly to, you know, scary. Uh, I wrote them up as individual chapters. They actually could stand alone as short stories. And I did have one of them published as a short story, Heart Attack. The book could not get published. I tried and tried and tried. And back in the day, you could send it directly to a publisher and they called it over the transom and they would yay or nay. And I kept getting it back. I kept getting it back. And they would say, uh, the writing is good. Uh, EMTs are, you know, important people. But bottom line, we don't know how to make money off this. It's not chick lit. It's not a fiction. It's not a historical Roman. We, we don't know what to do with it. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't publish it. And I was darned if I was good. I know I could do it myself, but I said, no, if it's not good enough to, for a publisher to do it, I'm not doing it got an agent because I was going to writing classes and uh, he said to me, I told him about the book, explained all of what I just explained to you. And he said, I will try to sell it for you. He said, but you've got to give me 20 more pages. I'm like 20 more pages, it's, it's intact. I've got the 25 calls, I've got a prologue and I've got an epilogue, what, what more do you want? And he says to me, oh, you know. And I go, no, I don't. <laughs> he said, well, there were guys and girls in the store in the uh, squad room. We stayed overnight. 
I'm sure there was a little. Oh no 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 no! no. We're not going kind of there. We're not. Go- Could I have? Maybe. But I wasn't about to. I still had family in the uniform services. I'm not doing any sexual. So he said, you know, sex sells. You don't put it. I drop me. Wouldn't try to publish it. So my book never got published. Well, you know, it's much easier now to self-publish. What's that? You can do it much easier now because you can self-publish and, and promote it yourself. Yeah, I know. But, you know, I don't know. I'm a little long in the tooth with that. So uh, in addition to writing a book... Um, I also, and I did self-publish two poetry chapbooks. Um, one was Poems for Unpretentious People, and the other one was uh, Echoes from a Bell Jar. And this one, I actually got, I felt so, <laughs> so important. I actually got to have a poetry reading at my local oh, um, nice. library, okay? And it was well attended. It was amazing. Uh, And I did what I always wanted to do. Poetry is wonderful, but it's so, so personal. The poet writes about things that he or she knows. And if you don't know, sometimes it's really hard to interpret what they're writing about. So I had the opportunity to sit down with 25, 30 people and explain before I read the poem, I would give them the background. I would tell them, this is why I wrote this. And this is what I was feeling. And it really went over well. It worked out well. The only glitch was um, some of the poems are of a romantic nature, and my son was sitting in the front row. So that was a little dicey. Though, okay? <laughs> but uh, he's a forgiving sort. He's, he's my youngest. You brought some he... earplugs for him. Earplugs. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to accentuate it. Anyway... <laughs> I'd like to read you just a very short uh, poem to give you an idea of, you know, how I write. Uh, this one I wrote about death. I'm, for some reason, fascinated by death and things that are deteriorating. Maybe it's because I'm old and I deteriorate. I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this poem was uh, written about death. I do want it, hopefully, read at the celebration of my life by one of my kids or uh, family or friends. I hope I have a copy of it with my um, pre-planned, prepaid for uh, funeral. Hopefully they'll read it and I'm going to read it to you. It's called The Adversary. Devising scenarios complex and diverse as nightmares, flatlining victims without compassion, discrimination, or guilt. You seep under door frames like wisps of smoke appearing at midnight when the hands of the clock hide its face and the ticking subsides to a whisper. When our confrontation commences, I will run barefoot through frozen fields, plucking stars from the sky to decorate my hair, pivot over the edge, and free fall through eternity. So that was my writing. And... um, We've gone through my jobs and my EMT experiences, my writing, and of course all play, all work and no play makes Jill a dull girl. Can I ask a question because we're going to go into photography. Out of the 25 uh, chapters in your book, which one got, you said one got published about a heart attack. Is that the most... um, is that the scariest one? Out of the no, ones? not at all. Not at all. I, I could, oh my God. Uh, scary ones were out on Route 22 with the uh, car accident. I hated them, the car accidents. Oh, yes. Absolutely yeah. terrified, frightening. It got, the police would come and their vision was to get the rig and the dunk out of the way so traffic could move, traffic could move. And I, I don't know how many times I almost, you know, got nailed. Uh, no, that, that was very scary. Of course, the baby story is in is one of the 25. There were heartbreaking stories. Um, we got called to a, um, a apartment complex. And here is this 80-something-year-old man in bed, unable to walk, unable to take, I don't know how they, his wife had died a couple of weeks before. And I think they took him in, but they brought him back and left him there. 
and he was emaciated. He wasn't eating. He had uh, wounds, and and uh, so we wrapped him up. We got him in the rig, and um, I'm in the back trying to take vitals and get some information. And he starts tugging on my sleeve, and he's saying, "Lady, lady, when I gonna die, lady? I got nobody left. When I gonna? Die? Oh my God! You know what do you say?" And that was a really sad one. On the other hand, uh, silly ones. Um, got to a call one day of an elderly woman had fallen in the bathtub. They were afraid to move her, which was good because, you know, they could do more damage. Uh, she had had dinner and she upchucked. Now, I was always the smallest one, so I always got sent into spaces where the other people, could, the other techs couldn't go. So I had to get in the tub with the spaghetti and stay, <laughs> stay, well, that's the, it gets worse, it gets, it gets better. Mm -hmm. I have to get in the tub, stabilize her as they slide the longboard under her to get her up and out. Well, I was leaning back and my butt hit the faucet and turned on. And now I've got water <laughs> running down my back and my butt and my legs and I'm trying not to laugh. And they're going, what's the matter with you? What's I said, the water, the water. Then everybody's cracking up. Thank God the bathroom was small and the family was on the outside because that's very unprofessional. But we all got it together and we got her. So I'm saying that it ran the gamut from sad to silly to scary. Um, and I, I couldn't understand why they didn't. When I would read these stories to people, they loved them. But I could not get anybody to uh, a, a publisher to say, yeah, we'll, we'll publish. So then I tried to pass it off as a memoir, but that didn't go anywhere either. Anyway, um, like I said, I had to do things that were fun. And um, one of the fun things was tap dancing. Now, the backstory on that one was when I was a kid, a little five-year-old, um, all my friends had their tap shoes and their ballet shoes and their costumes. I, they were in recitals and they were, I was so excited. I couldn't go to dance school. Why? I had flat feet. I had no arch. When I put my foot down, there was no light under the, it was just flat. So I said, why can't I be in the tap class? Why can't I, I'm a mommy. So mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys, no, the doctor, said, the doctor said, no, you can't let her tap. She'll ruin her feet, it's too bad. And I remember she used to throw uh, marbles on the uh, floor and I would have to pick them up with my toes. To str and eventually I, my arch came and I was, a, by that time it was too late, I was too old. I couldn't do it. So fast forward till I'm about 50 and my one of my sons comes home with a young woman they were dating and I was getting to know her and she happened to manage a mention that she used to teach dance so I was like oh and I told her my story so she said you want to learn I said I do she said I'm going to tell you where to go you get a pair of tap shoes I'll teach you oh my god I was ecstatic I wasn't going to get the costumes but I was going to get the tap so I did, I got the tap shoes. The first uh, song that we tapped to was uh, Kiki D and Elton John's Don't Go Breaking My Heart. <laughs> so she was teaching me all the basic steps, a cramp roll, a leap shuffle. Um, I can't even remember them all now. And then they broke up. So now here I am, brand new pair of tap shoes, know about five or 10 steps to one song and I can't, ask her to keep coming teaching me is very awkward okay so I said no I'm not letting go of this I wrote a letter I sent it to the surrounding studios I explained I was an adult and I wanted to know would they take me on they did one did so I started working with a teacher there and then another woman who wasn't as old as I was nobody's as old as I am but she was mature and so she came and she started working with me and we got into the recitals and I got my costumes and, and I tapped on stage and it was wonderful. And we taped it all and it was all, all good. And then I was downsizing. I moved from a bigger house to this little house that could. And I said, okay, I'm in my 60s now, enough with the tapping. And I stopped and I you know, had to get the house. I did a lot of work myself. I painted, I, whatever. Well, a few years later, the woman that I had tapped with originally called me. She said, Barbara, I found a new studio and a great tea. I said, no, 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 I'm done. I'm done. I'm too old. I'm not. Well, just come for one 
class. She won't charge you. You just come and observe. Well, you know what happened. I got to the thing. Oh, my God, they're tapping it. I'm... So I signed up, I, but I couldn't keep up with the class. They were, you know, they were younger than I was. So I went to the teacher. I said, you know, I really, she said, don't worry. She said, come in on your own. She said, half an hour a week. She gave me a reasonable rate. I tapped with her for 14 years till I turned 85. Wow. <laughs> and I... They sold the studio, and my back gave out. Otherwise, I would still be tapping. But it was wonderful. And I didn't do any recitals with her, but what we did was, since it was just the two of us, uh, I even got to the point where I could choreograph a little bit. So we would join together. We'd pick a song. She'd pick one one time. I'd pick one another time. And we would uh, make a little routine. And then um, we would tape it, either on... Uh, iPad or her husband had a camera. So I've got about, oh, I don't know, eight of those routines that we did. But that was my tap, uh, my whole tap thing. And I, uh, and then we, we did have a little recital, like we called it a day at tap class. We held it in the studio and I had my family and friends come in and we showed how we did the exercises at the bar. And then we did our little routine. Well, that was my tap thing. The other thing uh, that I did for fun, I guess you would call it, although it can be very frustrating, is photography. And I'm not really sure uh, how, I think I kind of got, I always like to take pictures. I think I got into that when uh, there was a festival on the green in Union and they were uh, giving out awards. It was kind of a contest. And one of my uh, photographs won a, a ribbon. And I thought that was pretty neat. So then I started looking into it more. And I want to say I was self-taught, but that's not entirely true because I did take some classes. I did attend seminars and workshops and gradually kept learning more and more about photography. Eventually, I had my own dark room. Um, I had two Nikon cameras, one that I kept with black and white and one that I kept with color film, so I was prepared for any eventuality. Um, and I went on to have uh, solo shows, um, group shows. I went on to win uh, a lot of, nothing epic, but you know, just ribbons and different contests and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then somebody turned me on to digital. Now I had said I would never go digital uh, I was a purist. I wanted to do film. I had my dark room, but I got to tell you, you know, it just sucks you in. It just sucks you in 
So I do now have a, a Nikon DS3500. And it's about all left I can do. Uh, I can still click the shutter. I can still look through the... <laughs> you don't have to develop any films. <laughs> and yeah, I don't have to develop any film. So that's all my stories. That's what I've kind of done through my life. Like I said, I've never gotten really good at anything. Um, the tapping, I used to call myself the galloping galump. Um, I, I did manage to, to get there. And it was hell on wheels trying to remember the routines because the older I got, the harder it is to remember. But it was good for me. It was good for me. But I used to have big boards and I would have the tap, the steps lined up and I would gradually, you know, remember them. And then the music helped to remember the steps. And the photography, yeah, I'm still kind of doing that. Not the way I was doing in the past. I, um, uh, I had one last show. It was going to be my um, swan song. Um, I called it Seasons. I, it took me a year. And I photographed summer, spring, fall, and winter, obviously. I enlarged them to 16 by 20s. And because I didn't want to get into a whole lot of expense or work, uh, one of the, oh, well, that's the other thing. Let me backtrack a minute. The first solo show I had was at Les Malamut Gallery in Union. And that was Child of My Child. I took pictures of my grandchildren. There were two grandsons at that point. So when I did, they took my show and I had it up and they invited me to join their board. So I did, and at the time, there were a lot of people on the board. But as time went by, they were all older, uh, who passed away, who couldn't drive anymore, who went to assisted living. And as they left, I would take over whatever they, so I ended up being a tre treasurer, secretary, vice president, uh, and then finally curator. Mm -hmm. Now, I had never curated a gallery before, so it was that was really learned by doing. So I did that uh, for several years and finally ended up having to, I was getting way too, it was too much for me. So I gave that to a, a, a very uh, talented lady to do the curating. I still do all the background stuff to keep it going. And I was going to show my show there. Well, COVID hit and they shut down the library and the gallery. So I think, okay, when COVID goes away, I'll be able to put my, uh, my show up. And then they announced they're demolishing the library. They're tearing the whole thing down. What, are they building a new one or are they just getting rid of the library? No, they're going to build a new oh. one. No one knows where the money's coming from. <laughs> no one's been able to tell me that. But it's going to be two to three years before it's rebuilt. And by that time, <laughs> forget it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. So I've got a show now with, uh, with nowhere to go. And then the other uh, place I curated for was... Um, our local library, I walked in there one day and they had a what's called a walker display system. It was all up, but there was nothing hanging on it. So I went to the director. I said, hey, I said, you got this great system because it's a wonderful uh, way to hang photography or paintings or whatever. I know, I know, but I have no time. Could you get us artists? So now I'm curating for both, and I can't tell you how many times I got mixed up with which artist is at which gallery. But uh, so I was at one time curating for both uh, both galleries. But now, of course, uh, they still haven't opened up here, uh, even though um, the other one is going to be demolished. So that's done. So I have a whole show sitting there, and uh, and and no nowhere to to put it up. And that's about it. That's, that's uh, all the things I've, I've, I've done. I, I hesitate to say accomplished because, uh, you know, my, my photographs are so-so. My tapping was so-so. My EMT was so-so. My writing was so-so. Uh, but I loved it. I had fun. I had fun. That's and now part I, of it. If you have fun, it's all mad. Uh, and now I, I'm just going to coast toward the finish line. That's my goal. Now, when you're photography, what, what type of subjects did you did you shoot? People, landscapes? I was, uh, uh, the, well, one of the things I did, one of the shows I had actually, when I was doing the um, tap um, at the uh, dress rehearsals, I would bring my camera and I would go backstage. In fact, I titled the uh, show Backstage. And I would try to catch the kids 
They were all dressed in their costumes, obviously, and I would try to catch them um, off, I call those candid portraits. So, and they would call me the camera lady. And of course, as soon as they saw me, they would pose and I would go, no, 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 that's all right. You, do, you go ahead, you go ahead. And uh, I, I, I took a whole series. Then I ran into a roadblock because when I wanted to show the show, uh, one gallery turned me down. They said, well, you didn't have model releases. Mm -hmm. I said, well, it's in a public, I, I, I consulted with a star ledger photographer that I happen to know. And I said, what do you think? He said, it's a gray area. He said, it was a public place. He said, and everybody was taking pictures. He said, are you going to sell them? I said, no, absolutely not. He said, I wouldn't worry about it. I think he said, Is, what's that old saying? It's better to ask forgiveness uh, right, than, yeah, than permission. <laughs> permission. Right, yeah. right. So I went ahead. Actually, I had that showed in two different places. And I never got a ripple. I never got a, I never, I never had a problem. But um, So they were dancers waiting to get on stage? Is yeah. Right? But that sounds very interesting as a... a Different well, way of looking at it. Most people take pictures of dancers. Yeah, I unstated. didn't yeah. send you any pictures of those because I I don't know. Uh, again, I'm wondering if it goes on YouTube. No, no, unless I'll, you're selling it, I don't think no, it's an issue. No, all right, I'll send somebody you. Somebody personally complains about it. I'll so. send you a few pictures. Uh, of course, my other big thing is gardening, both indoors and outdoors. And all summer long, I'm out there with my, I know my neighbors think I'm nuts, but that's that's fine. They don't bother me and I don't bother them. I'm out there taking pictures of, oh, I should show you. Um, I take pictures of all my flowers, okay? And <laughs> I find things to keep me out of trouble and off the streets. <laughs> and one of the things I do is in February, when I've had it with winter, because I am not a winter person. I hate winter. I hate shutting the house up. I hate not being able to go out in the garden. I will sit down with my fake fireplace and I will make myself a cup of hot chocolate with a little peppermint schnapps. And I will take my pictures. Uh, of course, now with the digital, I have to have them printed, but that's all right. I get them printed and I audition them and I pick which ones and I have a big poster board and it says garden and then the date and then I take off last year's pictures and I put all my new uh, flower pictures on and that's up for the whole year going forth. So flowers, uh, kids at the recital, um, some landscaping um, and then whatever the other night I walked out and I looked up and I said, oh my God, look at the sun. What's going on? Ah, oh, it's that haze from the uh, wildfires. Yeah. It was gorgeous. So I ran back in the house again. The camera's right there. I grabbed it, went outside, took a nice picture of the sun with all the haze around it and put it on my Facebook page. Uh, you know, and, and I, I'll, I'll do that kind of thing. If something comes, I'm trying to get a good moon shot. I've been trying to do that for two years. <laughs> I, I got shots, but it, they don't seem to be what, what I want. And in fact, tonight, full moon, oh. full moon tonight. So I'm hoping I'm going to get out there. Maybe tonight I'll get that shot that I've been looking for. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, stay off the streets. Yeah. Full moon. So that's it. basically, uh, you know, I've, I've taken pictures of my neighbor's kids. Um, I'm an equal opportunity photographer. Whatever comes to mind, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really specialize in anything. Well, as long as you're having fun, that's what it is. Whoever has the most fun yeah. wins. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, your story. Oh, my pleasure. It, 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 this was fun. <laughs> It's fun for us to listen. I didn't want really to interrupt too much. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for that because I, th I was afraid you'd throw me off and I wouldn't get all my little details. No, in. I, I listened to what you said at the beginning. So, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. Well, thank you. And um, we'll, we'll talk soon. <laughs> okay. Very good. I'll be looking forward to seeing it.